afternoon, everybody. That first service messed me up. Uh, in the first service, I did something a little bit different, but the Lord's telling me to do something different now. So we're going to see how it goes. Uh, that's what you'll find out of me. I'm not a very good preacher, but I listen to what God's telling me, so hopefully it'll mold together. Uh, like Brent said, my name's Ricky Wilson. I'm 27 years old. I have a wife, Sarah, and a little baby named Ellie. Uh, Ellie sometimes talks when I'm preaching. That's just her saying amen. So if you hear her, go along with her. Just say amen with her. Uh, she started saying dada the other day, so that's pretty cool. My wife's kind of upset about it because she didn't start saying mama. So hopefully she'll say that for you all and you guys will get some cuteness dose while I'm preaching. and It'll make everything worth it. Uh, like Brent said, I have a story. I think that we all have a story. We've all been places. We've all wanted to be somewhere else at times, I think, too. Uh, I know when, I'm, when I used to be a banker, I could not wait till 5 o'clock. I'd be tripping all day. I'd be like, I just want to get out of here. And it seems like time slows down. Students, y'all know what I'm talking about school, right? It's like it's 245 forever. You know what I mean? Like you're stuck in the Bermuda Triangle and time never moves. That's how I used to feel when I was at the bank. Since then, it seems like my time's just crazy all the time. Uh, but I think that we all feel like that sometimes, that we want something more than what we have. Have you all ever thought this? If I just got that promotion, I would be happy. Or if I just had that car, I'd be happy. Or if my kids would just listen, I'd be happy. I'm really funny, I promise. Y'all got, come on. I got jokes. They're just not very good. Uh, but I, I think we've all been in that place. I know that I have. I'm a church planter in Spartanburg, South Carolina. That means I moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina with no money. And now I'm there and I live in this apartment complex. And it's awesome because there's people who don't know the Lord everywhere. The apartment manager is an atheist, which is my cup of tea. I love to go and hang out with her and share the word of God with her and see her move just a little bit toward Jesus. And that's why I live in that apartment complex. I can't afford it. It is brand new and it's a luxury apartment complex. Me and my wife are going to live in the ghetto and we are going to be happy about it. But my pastor called me. He was like, hey, we want you to move into this apartment complex. And I had just read Hebrews 11 where it says you can't please God without faith. And I was like, okay, let's do this. So the Lord has been gracious to us in that. He's paid six months of our rent. Think about that. I didn't do it. I, I didn't. I didn't. I have earned no money, but the Lord has supplied us with it so that we can pay six months of rent and so that we can continue to be Jesus in that apartment complex. I live in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where there is a huge inner city population and a huge college student population. That doesn't make that much sense, right? But there's six universities in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So there's 18,000 college students at a total population of 290,000 people. That's a huge population. Then there's also this inner city, which covers about 20% of the population, and nobody will go there. Nobody will go there because they're scared to interact with people that are a little bit different than them. And then there's also this other population of people in South Carolina, people who have this religiosity factor, who think they know Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus tells us that even the demons know his name and shudder. Knowledge is a hard thing. In South Carolina, it's a very hard thing because you know a little bit about Jesus, so you think you're saved, but you're not saved until you have a relationship with Jesus. Right? Until you accept that grace that God gives you. So I'm going to jump into some scripture. Like I said, I'm going to do this sermon just a little bit different than I did the morning one. But I can't do it alone, so let's go Lord in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are and thank you for your strength. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your son. Dear Lord, I am not good enough, but you make me good enough. Dear God, I am not equipped, but you equip me. Dear Lord, I am not a gifted speaker, but you speak through me. Dear Lord, it's not by what I'm doing, but it's by what you're doing. Dear Lord, these people today, their hearts are going to be changed not by me, but by you. Dear God, Amelia is going to be changed not by me, but by you, dear Lord. Not by the these people, not by Brent, not by Brandon, but by your name and your power and your son. Dear Lord, I pray that you enter this place in a mighty way. Dear God, that your Holy Spirit is welcome here, that you fill this place with your presence and you move in a powerful way, dear Lord, where the doors start to shake, where people start to wonder what's going on at Bridgeway Amelia, dear Lord, where your name is prevalent, dear God, where your name is being magnified, where your name is being glorified. Dear Lord, move in a mighty way. Dear God, shake the walls of Amelia. Shake the ground, dear Lord. Show us that you are God and show us that your son is Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm a little bit different than Brent. I get kind of pumped. Uh, I'm sorry, but the first service is on a time limit, so I had to like restrict myself, so y'all are going to be here till like 3 o'clock. So if you haven't had lunch, find somebody with a granola bar in their purse. 
But Genesis chapter 50, verses 17 through 21 is where we're going to be. Actually, let's just jump down to 18. I'm going to skip 17. And it says, His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good that is now being done for the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you, your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So this is the culmination of the story of Joseph. Many of y'all know the story of Joseph. Joseph had a dad. His name was Jacob. Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah. Rachel had two sons, Benjamin and Joseph. And Jacob loved Rachel the most. He was tricked into marrying Leah, and it was this whole story. But Jacob loved Rachel, and he loved these two children that came from Rachel, and he had a special love from them. And the other brothers started to see it, started seeing that Jacob loved Joseph more, and that rubbed him a little bit the wrong way. Rubbed him a little bit the wrong way. Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors, and it was beautiful, and it was revered by the other brothers. Jo- Jacob started noticing something was a little bit different about Joseph. Joseph started having these dreams, and in these dreams, God told Joseph that you're going to rule over your brothers, and you're going to rule over your father. Now, older siblings in here, if your younger sibling comes to you and says, I'm going to rule over you, that's not going to go well. You're probably going to punch them, and they're probably going to cry. So think about that. Think about the animosity that's starting to be built up. It's like the front seat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you're the oldest, you get the front seat. The youngest better not sit there. You're going to throw them out of the car. That's how it works. And Jacob started to see this within his sons. Joseph started to see this within his sons, within his brothers. And his brothers just had a lot of resentment. One day his brothers were out tending the flock. And Jacob said, hey, Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers, make sure everything's good. So Joseph set out on a journey to go check on them. And they see him coming from a long way away. And they're like, oh, man, here comes Joseph, the one who says he's going to rule over us. And Reuben is the good brother. Judah's a little bit crazy. Y'all got that sibling who'll just do anything? Like that crazy one that you're like, you've got to like hold back, pull back? I do. I have four sisters, so I got a lot of those. But Judah is like, hey, you know what we should do to Joseph? Kill him. And everybody's like, whoa, I don't know if that's the best idea. Reuben in particular is like, that's probably not a good idea. You know what we should do? We should push him in a hole. There's a big cistern here that holds water. It's empty. Let's push him down there. So they push him down there. And they're eating lunch and hanging out, looking at Joseph, just hanging out in the hole. And Reuben goes away for a while. And Judah's like, you know, let's not kill him because we can sell him into slavery. Then we can make some money and it'll be great. So they go ahead. The Ishmaelites roll up. Do you guys know what gypsies are? The Ishmaelites is this band of gypsies. There's the dirty people. The Bible refers to them as workers like a donkey. They just work for everything. They live in the desert. They're dirty. They roll up and they sell Joseph into slavery to the Ishmaelites. Now, the Ishmaelites are an interesting story because Abraham had two sons. Remember back in the day, God told Abraham he was going to have a son named Isaac. And Abraham and Sarai took it upon themselves to have Hagar have a child with Abraham. And it got all this mess and Ishmael was born from that. And God said, I'm going to make a great generation of the Ishmaelites also, but they're going to cause trouble for the Israelites their whole lives. And that's what happened. See, this is another kind of culmination of God telling him that that's going to happen because Joseph's an Israelite. He's sold to the Ishmaelites and the Ishmaelites take him to Egypt. Now Reuben comes back and sees that his brother's gone and he tears his clothes and he starts to mourn because he said, what are we going to tell our father? So they take Joseph's robe and they dip it in some blood and they take it back to Jacob and like, Joseph's dead. He got killed by an animal, not us. We didn't do it, but an animal did it. Now the father, Jacob, is obviously devastated. But now back to Joseph. He's in Egypt He rolls up, the Ishmaelites sold him to a guy named Potiphar. So he's sold into a household to be a slave. He starts from the bottom and raises all the way to the top of that household. The only person with more power than him is Potiphar, the guy who owns it. Because God shows him favor and blesses everything that he does. You guys know that song, Started from the Bottom, Now I'm Here? Yeah, something, no, 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 okay. But it's probably a bad song, I probably shouldn't have said that. But that's okay. So now he's in this household. He raises ranks. Stuff's going good. But Potiphar's wife starts to be a little sinful and is like, Joseph's a good-looking dude. I want to get me some of Joseph. Now, 
Potiphar is not there. Uh, the wife starts to pray on Joseph, and Joseph says, no, I'm not going to sin against my God. But one day he's in the house, and it's just those two. And Potiphar's wife gets a little tricky. She's like, I'm just going to take him. I'm going to rip his robe off. So she grabs a hold of his robe and rips it off. And Joseph, the man of God that he is, runs. Runs out the house naked. Runs out of there. Imagine that. Runs out of the house naked. Now, Potiphar's wife is kind of hurt because what happens when you get rejected? You get hurt. Guys, y'all know what I'm talking about. Think about junior prom, senior prom. You got rejected a lot. Teenagers in here right now. I hope y'all don't get rejected. But if you do... Keep moving on. So she gets a little bit mad, though. So she devises this plan and tells Potiphar, look, I have Joseph's robe. He tried to force himself on me today. Potiphar, being the husband that he is, gets a little bit upset, like most husbands in here would. So he throws Joseph in prison. So Joseph went through these stages. He was sold into slavery. Then it was going pretty good. Then he goes back down to the bottom, and now he's in prison again. Now he's stuck, desolate, just thinking, what am I going to do? So he's in prison, and God blesses him in prison. The warden finds favor in Joseph, and Joseph just starts hitting stuff, and God's blessing it, and he's moving up. Now he's the second in prison. Now he's second to the warden in prison. And one day, the Pharaoh throws his cupbearer and his baker in prison. Now God was setting stuff up. They're in prison, and they have these dreams. Because Pharaoh doesn't know who's guilty, but the cupbearer has a dream and says, cupbearer, uh, cup I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be released. Pharaoh's going to find out it wasn't you, and the, cu- and the breaker's going to be beheaded. And the cupbearer sounds, that sounds okay to me because I'm going to get out of here. And Joseph says to him, this is what I want you to do. Just remember me when you get out of here. Get me out of here. And the cupbearer's like, of course I will. You've helped me out so much, it's going to be no problem. So the cupbearer gets out, and he obviously forgets about Joseph. So Joseph's still stuck in prison. Time goes by. God continues to grow Joseph. Now the cupbearer is with Pharaoh again. Pharaoh starts having some dreams. Pharaoh starts having some dreams. And basically, Pharaoh calls all the magicians, all the tarot card readers, all the I can tell you what's going to happen to you, 1-800-FIND-OUT or whatever. He calls all those people together, and none of them can interpret the dreams. Nobody. And then the cupbearer is finally like, oh, yes, Pharaoh, in prison, this dude interpreted the dreams for me through God. How about we bring him here? So, Cupbearer finally remembers him. I don't know how much time it was, but probably a long time. And they go and they get Joseph and they bring him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him the dreams and Joseph says, my God can interpret those dreams. And he tells him there's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be food everywhere is what this dream means. Then there's going to be seven years nothing. There's not going to be food anywhere. There's going to be no way to get it. So Pharaoh's like, and Joseph's like, we need to save up food so that we can survive during that seven years of famine. Pharaoh's like, that's a great idea. I need to put somebody in charge of that. Who am I going to put in charge of it? Who's the wisest person in Egypt? And then Pharaoh's like, hey, well, Joseph has the will of God, the power of God. Let's put him in charge of it. And he does, and everything goes just as Joseph said, just as God told Joseph to say. Seven years of plenty hit. Joseph stores up so much food that during the seven years of famine, there's no food anywhere except for in Egypt. So other people are coming to buy it. Other people are coming to buy it. Joseph's rising up the ranks. And one day, here comes his brothers. His father had sent him to buy food because they didn't have any food. It was desolate there. Nothing anywhere. So the brothers are there. Joseph sees them. He tricks them a little bit because he's like, I'm not going to tell them who I am right away. So the brothers, Joseph says that they're spies. Says, you're spies. Go back and get the rest of your family. So they are scared to death. They go back. They bring the rest of their family back. And Joseph reveals to them who he is. And he forgives them. He just forgives them. Then time goes by, now Jacob's dying, the father's dying. The father's about to be gone, and they get scared again. They're like, Joseph just forgave us because of our dad. Dad, go tell him to forgive us. So they go, and that's where we're at right now. They come, and they throw themselves at his feet, and Joseph starts to weep because Joseph said, I already forgave you. See, I'm in the place of God. God has brought me here for a reason. God has placed me in this position and it's for the saving of many lives so that God's will can be accomplished. And he says, I'll take care of you and I'll take care of your families. I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to take care of your families. You see, Joseph was in the valleys but reached the mountaintops. Joseph was probably one of those guys who, was, who people looked at his life and said, how can you be happy doing what you're doing? How can you be happy doing what you're doing? Joseph said, because God has a bigger plan than what I can imagine. See, I relate to that a little bit. See, I grew up in a small town called Fateville, Ohio. Y'all know where Fateville's at? No? It's in Brown County. Y'all know Brown County? 
Say it like that. Brown County. Repeat after me. Brown County. Okay, I'm going to get you all talking by the end of the service. I promise you that. So that's where I'm from. It's a really small town. One stoplight. If you go through there speeding, you're going to get pulled over. Every, sometimes if you're not even speeding, you're going to get pulled over. It's a small town. So I grew up there. I had four sisters, and I was super poor. Didn't have nothing. Do you guys know what spam is? Yeah, well, that was like a special occasion thing at my house. We would get spam every once in a while. Or Vienna sausages. There was five kids, so we barely ever got those. That was like a special treat. Like that was like candy to me. And now I'm not allowed to eat them, even though I can kind of afford them. Because my wife says any meat that comes in a can cannot be good for you. And she says it's probably not meat. So don't read the ingredients, but they are delicious. But that was like a special treat. So I was really poor, but I didn't know I was really poor until I went to school. When I went to school, I found out I am super poor. I don't have anything these kids have. I'm a poor, poor kid. Now, my parents, they were a little bit different. They would always drink drinks out of brown paper bags and smoke these funky smelling cigarettes. So I was like, okay, this is just normal, I guess. Like, we'd be riding in a car, and they'd be drinking this drink, and they'd be like, you want a swig? And I'd be like, ooh, this is nasty. Give me some more of that. But, see, nobody gets my joke. <laughs> I promise I'm funny. But, so I grew up pretty normal um, <laughs> to me, I guess. So, but when I was 12 years old, my life changed a little bit. Three of my sisters had moved out. It was just me and my little sister now. And I come home from school one day. And my parents told me there was a demon upstairs. Now, y'all ever watched The Exorcist, head spinning around, vomiting? Ever? That's what I thought was upstairs. So as a 12-year-old kid, what do you do when your parents tell you that? You freak out. You cry. And that's what I did. I was crying everywhere. And my parents were like, we got to pray it out of here. And we've never been to church. So I was like, what are you talking about? So they light this ring of candles, and they start to pray. And they're not even talking in a language I understand. And they're saying all this crazy stuff. Come to find out they were reenacting a movie because they were tripping on a drug called meth. Y'all know what meth is? Yeah, my parents got addicted to that when I was 12 years old. So a couple weeks later, it continues. I come home from school. It's October 26th. October 26th was my dad's birthday. So like, this is going to be normal. There's going to be cake. Cake's great. You know what I'm talking about, right? You like cake. So I come home. I was like, there's going to be cake. It's going to be good. Walk in there, nobody's there. <laughs> One of my older sisters is there, and she doesn't live there anymore, and she's rolling up a rug. A couple hours later, I get a call from my dad, and he's in the hospital, and I get a call from my mom, and she's in jail. What had happened was my mom stabbed my dad. So when you come down off drugs, you get angry. I had seen this from my mom plenty of times. I've seen my mom try to kill my dad with deer antlers before. Like, I've seen all that stuff, and my, my mom finally stabbed him, and now he's in the hospital, and she goes to jail. So I lose my mom, the one who was kind of keeping stuff together, and now it's just my dad, me, and my little sister. And my dad goes into a downward spiral. He's overdosing all the time. My house got broken into multiple times. Our cars got stolen. I would come home from school, and he'd be overdosed in the car. And I'd either have to figure out how to bring him out of it or call 911. So my life began to take this drastic switch, this drastic move. And at 12 years old, I realized I needed to make money. So I began buying and selling stolen property, which led me into buying and selling drugs, which leads me into the next eight years of my life. So now I'm 18. Let's fast forward just a little bit. I'm an angry person. I have a huge hole inside of me that I'm trying to fill with stuff. I'm hurting people to try to make myself feel a little bit better because it seems like anger is the only emotion that makes me feel good. And when I hit somebody or when I hold a gun to somebody's head, that makes me feel a little bit better. But I feel still not right. So I try to make more money and that doesn't fill that hole. And then I'm like, if somebody would love me, that would make me feel better. So I go and I get women just to have them sit next to me so it can feel like I can feel an emotion. So it feels like there's somebody there and I'm not alone. That doesn't work. I find out that I have a couple of things wrong with me. I have depression, anxiety, PTSD, and OCD. And I start to deal with these things. I get addicted to a drug called Xanax. That leads me into the next three years of my life. During this three years, I get really angry. I almost kill multiple people. My heart is broken. I'm now taking care of my mom, my dad, my little sister, my niece who's 12 years old who came to live with me because my oldest sister was addicted to heroin. So I'm taking care of this whole family, driving people. Nobody had a license except for me. My little sister gets addicted. All my other sisters get addicted except for one. The one that didn't get addicted starts inviting me to church. I'm like, heck no. Church people are weird. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You guys don't even laugh at my jokes. But no. So they, she starts to invite me. I'm like, no, because the only thing I knew about church was what I had seen on TV. 
So like I knew judgmental, hypocritical, all those false perceptions that media puts out about Christians. So that's all I understood. But she asked me like 10 times, and finally I was like, okay, I'll go. So we roll up to a church in Hillsboro, Ohio. Y'all know Hillsboro? Highland County. Yes. So we go up to this church, and I pull up, and I'm like, I am not going in there. It was a small country church. It had stained glass windows. I was like, this looks like a weird place. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I should be in here. But I go in anyway, and they're playing this song, What Can Wash My Sins Away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You have to understand, I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know what sin is. I don't understand that term. And I don't know why these dudes want to wash me in blood. But I start to emotionally snap. Like, I am crying all over the place. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to figure it out. So I go and I sit down in a pew, and this old dorky-looking mug comes up on the stage. His name was Dave Hansen. Awesome dude, but he was wearing a white robe, and I was like, this is not going to be good. I was like, I do not want to listen to this. But I'm sitting there, and I tune him out, but I hear him say, Jesus loves me. Now, that blows my mind, because at 12 years old, I was abandoned, and I had been searching for love, but never found it. So when he told me somebody loved me, I said, i got to find out more about this i got to get disqualified from this love because I'm not good enough for it either, so i got to talk to this guy so I can tell him that so he can figure it out that Jesus doesn't love everybody. So I go to his house, I meet with him for the next three weeks, and I tell him everything who I am. See, I had hidden most of my stuff because I didn't want people to judge me and people to look at me differently. That's what kids do, right? I was 20 years old. I didn't want people to think I was different. But I tell him everything, and he looks at me and he says, you had a messed up childhood. He's like, but that doesn't matter because Jesus died on a cross for you. Jesus died on a cross for you, which washes all that stuff away, which makes you a new creation, which we see in Corinthians. So all that stuff is gone if you accept Jesus. I accepted Jesus on that day. That was seven years ago. And since then, the Lord has been blowing up in my life. I met my wife six months later. She is awesome. Her mom was awesome. Her mom took me from the small country church I was in because nobody wanted to mess with me or disciple me. So she started discipling me. And made me read the Bible, made me teach this missions program for children called CIA's Children in Action. I was like, heck no. I was like, I can't teach nobody. I don't even know the Bible. And she hands me this book, and she's like, read this. I'm like, okay. So I go in there, and I love it. It's awesome. I love teaching the children. I'm like, well, I could do if they, children are kind of rough. I was like, I don't know if I can do children, but I would like to do somebody else. But no, I'm just kidding. Children are awesome. So I have one. But, uh, <laughs> but. I love it. It's just where I'm supposed to be. I realize a call into ministry. I reject it for a while. In 2014, my wife and I got married. We moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina, where she did an internship at the deaf school, and I did an internship at a church, and the Lord was blowing up. But I was like, Lord, where are we supposed to go next? I wanted to go to Texas because I wanted to go to school there. But God called us back to Cincinnati, which I was happy about because I did not like South Carolina. So we go back to Cincinnati, and we were at a church right down the road here, and the Lord started to blow up. Our youth group went from 12 to 35. We've seen 48 salvations in 18 months. We've seen uh, doors open at local schools to where I was able to preach the gospel at Amelia High School, Glen Esty High School, uh, that one high school, what's it called? Felicity High School, Williamsburg High School. The Lord started to open doors. I was preaching the gospel during the day. During the day, which is unheard of, but God was opening up doors to where that was allowing me to do that. And then I read Deuteronomy 28. I remember it specifically. I was in Nashville. And Deuteronomy 28 is the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. And God started to tell my heart that he was moving me away from that ministry. See, God was blowing up. I was like, God, where are you going to take us? Like, do you see what's happening here? He's like, yeah, I'm doing it. You're just my vessel. I don't need you to do it. And God made it easier for us with some situations that happened. And he called us into church planning. I was like, what is church planning? I was like, I don't know how to build stuff, so that's not going to help me none. So I was like, what am I supposed to do, God? So God began to present me with people who told me what church planning was, and I loved it. I was like, that's what I want to do. I was like, God, I know you're calling me to that. I know that this is what you want me to do. So God moved us back to Spartanburg, South Carolina. And during this time, I got multiple offers to plant churches, multiple offers to pastor churches. But I knew that God was calling me there, and I know nothing outside of God's will is as good as what God has for you. So he called us there, and I developed a love for it overnight. Like, I love that place now. Love to be there. Love the people. So that's where we're at now. But I tell you this story not to say, look at me. I tell you this story to show you that sometimes God brings us into the valleys so that we can reach the mountaintops. Sometimes God takes us to places we don't want to be, to areas that we don't want to be, so that he can take us to a refining. 
so that he can make us usable, so that he can make us equipped to reach the people that are in our situation. You see, some of you are thinking, and I know, you're thinking, if I just get that promotion, everything will be okay. It won't. And students, you guys are thinking, if I can just get out of high school, everything's going to be fine. Here's the it won't. See, because how we often look at situations, if I can just get out, but God's saying, just be happy in the situation that you're in. God says, look at the situation that you're in and look at the opportunity that you have around you. See, Amelia is a dark place. There's a lot of sin in Amelia. There's a lot of sin in Spartanburg. But you guys are positioned in Amelia to where you can make an impact through the gospel on everybody positioned in Amelia. See, don't look at it. I just can't wait to get out of Amelia. Look as it is. These people need Jesus. See, because so often we think that people with bigger houses than us are more favored by God than us. But you have to remember our position does not define our favor. God loves you no matter where you're at. God is pursuing you no matter where you're at. And your situation that you're in right now is preparing you for something that God has ahead of you. That's hard to take in. That's hard to understand. Because some of you might be dealing with a death. And you're saying, God, I'm in this death. My person passed away. What am I supposed to do? You say, Ricky, you don't understand that. How can you deal with that? How can you say that God has a plan when I'm in this situation? Because I've dealt with death. I lost my mom to a drug overdose. I lost my dad to a drug overdose. I lost my sister to a drug overdose. I lost my aunt to a drug overdose. I lost my uncle to a drug overdose. I lost my mother-in-law to cancer. I lost my grandfather to cancer two days later. But I know that God was using those situations to prepare me for standing right in front of you right now. I know that God led my grandfather to Christ, and I know that God led my mom to Christ. I know that God was working in situation that I didn't understand, but I didn't want to be in that situation, but I know that he was refining me for where I'm at right now. God uses every situation. God uses Hurricane Irma. God's using it for something. God used Harvey. God is using Harvey. Maybe it's for us as Christians to step up and say, I'm sick of sitting in these pews. I want to be Jesus to everybody. Maybe it's, it's something that I don't even understand because I don't, I don't know God's mind. But I know the valleys and I know God is taking each and every one of us to the mountaintop. See, God wants to take you to the mountaintop. God wants to use you in a mighty way. But so often we restrict God from using us because we say, God, we're not worthy to be used. You're worthy to be used. You're worthy to be used. If you're 70 years old, old in here, you're worthy to be used. If you're 12 years old in here, you're worthy to be used. If you're from a broken family, you're worthy to be used. My grandpa was a pimp downtown his entire life. He was a drug dealer. He's the one who taught me how to deal drugs. But Jesus said, I want you and I'm going to use you. And he accepted Christ two days before he died. Because Jesus doesn't care where you come from. There's a woman in the Bible named Rahab. And Rahab was a prostitute. And Rahab lived in the ghetto. She lived in the wall of Jericho where nobody wanted to go. And God said, I'm going to use you, Rahab. God said, you know what's going to happen with you? Jesus is going to come from your line. Because Jesus comes from brokenness, we can be reassured that God, Jesus, is pursuing brokenness. See, Jesus is calling you today into a relationship with him. Just like Joseph and his brothers. His brothers came and they dropped themselves before Joseph's feet. And they say, forgive me. And Joseph said, I'm in the place of God. He said, I'm right where God wants me to be. Why would I be mad at you? And Joseph forgives them. Look at the picture of Christ that that is. Joseph forgave somebody who sold him into slavery. How hard is it for you to forgive somebody who stole $20 from you? Joseph forgave these people who sold him into slavery and says, I'm going to care for you and your children, just like Jesus did. When we hung him on a cross, when we hung him on a criminal's death, when we said, you're not good enough, you're not who you said you were, and we hung him on a cross... He said, Father, forgive them. They not know what they do. They not know what they do. How great is our Jesus? How great is our Son? How great is our Savior? See, God is calling you today to a new situation. Maybe you're in one of those valleys that I was talking about. Let God take you to the mountaintop. Let God take you to the mountaintop and let the mountaintop be where your situation is right now. Joseph understood it. Joseph was in prison. And God said, I got you. Joseph said, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. Joseph said, I know that I have faith in you, God. I have faith that you can move the mountains. I have faith that you will move the mountains. In Egypt, there's a group of Christians. And there's a mountain or a pyramid, as I like to call it, because that's what it's called. And there's a pyramid. And these Christians in Egypt were in such a dark place, and they prayed for so long that this pyramid moved. They kept praying that God would show Egypt how great he is. And so God moved a pyramid. 
God wants to move a pyramid in Amelia. God wants to move a pyramid in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And that's why I'm there. That's why I'm saying, God, I don't care what I go through. God, I don't care if I'm broke. God, I just want to see you move. God, I just want to see people come to know you. A soul is not worth my comfort. A soul lost is not worth my comfort. See, you need to say that today. You need to say Amelia's dark and Walmart's dark and I'm going to go be Jesus over there. You need to say Bridgeway is going to have an impact on everything around us. Bridgeway is going to be where Jesus is. Bridgeway is going to be the voice of Jesus to this lost community. To this lost community here in Amelia, to the lost community in Moscow to the lost community in Spartanburg. See, by you all giving me the money that you give me every month, that Brent and Brandon so graciously decided to bestow upon us, God allows me to do ministry there. So you're reaching Spartanburg, South Carolina. Think about that. You're sitting in a seat and you're reaching Spartanburg, South Carolina. You're having an impact. See, because impact happens through us giving the contributions that God has given us to. Impact happens when we act, no matter how it is. So God is calling you today. Some of you may be in a valley and you're wondering how to get out. God's the answer. Some of you might be at the mountaintop and you're wondering what more can you do. You can reach Amelia with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been here for two weeks. Two weeks. I've preached six times. This is my seventh time. And the Lord has taken 25 people from death to life. 25. Not because of who I am, because I'm a gifted speaker. Not because I'm funny, because y'all know I'm not. But... Because Jesus is alive and active through our faith and through our surrender to him. He's positioned you in a place of power. He's positioned you as a son and daughter. And those of you who don't know Jesus, he's positioned you to become his son and daughter. I'm going to ask Brandon to come out here. And Brandon's going to play a song of invitation for us. But I'm not done talking because I feel like the Spirit's got some more to say. But... Here's what I need you to do. I know this is a small crowd, so this is going to be even more possible. This is going to be even more possible. I just need you to throw your hand on the person next to you. I just need you to bow your head and throw your hand on the person next to you. And I'm going to pray for us because somebody next to you may be going through a valley and they're trying to reach the mountaintop. Because somebody next to you might be hurting. Somebody next to you might be the person that I was when I came into that country church and I sat down. And I said, I'm not worthy. Somebody sitting next to you may be feeling that same way and God wants to enter their life in a powerful way. So just pray with me real fast and then I'm going to wrap up. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are and thank you that it doesn't matter if we're in a valley or a mountaintop. Thank you that your favor does not determine our position. Dear God, if we got a nice car, that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that we're more blessed. Dear God, if we got $10,000 in the bank, that doesn't mean that we're more blessed than the person with five. Dear God, your power is what we're looking for. Your presence, your son, your salvation. Dear God, come into lives in a mighty way. Show them peace and comfort that only you can give. Show them how great you are and allow your presence to move across the million. Dear God, there's lost people out there. You say that you're the God of the harvest and we got to pray for the workers. Dear God, I'm praying for the workers right now and I know that you're going to send them into the harvest field. I know that you're going to move in ways that I can't imagine. I know that you're going to see people taken from death to life. Dear Lord, allow us to be your light in this dark world. Allow us to shine with your sun. Allow us to be the ones you've equipped, the ones that you've called, the ones that you've made your sons and your daughters. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's what I'm going to do. I don't want you to leave here the same way that you came in. Even if you're a Christian, you have to leave here with your heart broken. You have to leave here with it in pieces. I pray every day that God will break my heart for the lost. Because there's a dying world that's going to hell. But there's a Savior that's offering salvation in eternity with the Creator. You can't leave here the same as when you walked in, people. You can't leave here and say they don't matter. You can't leave here and say the cashier doesn't matter or the waitress to where you're going to eat doesn't matter. You have to say this person is a son and daughter. This person is being called into relationship with Jesus and I'm the vessel that God's going to use. You have to leave here saying I'm worth something. You have to leave here saying my life doesn't determine where I'm going. God doesn't see my past, but he sees where he's going to take me. God doesn't care where I came from, but he cares in the potential where he's leading me. God's saying, today's the day of salvation. So here's what I'm going to do. Bow your heads with me. 
Bow your heads with me. And if you need Jesus, today's the day to do that. If your heart is empty, you got a hole and you can't fill it with anything else and fill it with Jesus today. Jesus came, he died for sinners like us. People who disobey him. He said, I'm going to go to this cross and die a sinner's death because I want my people. I want my people. We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. I sin every day. But Jesus is calling us in a relationship with him to wash that sin away through the blood because Jesus ain't dead. Jesus went to the tomb and three days later, he was resurrected. Right now today, he sits with the Father petitioning for each and every one of us. So if you're here today and you need Jesus, I need you to put your hand in the air. I need you to put your hand in there if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. If, you don't, if you've never said, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. Jerry, Jesus, there's nothing I can do alone. Then today's the day to accept that and quit living on your own strength and live on the strength of Christ. Today's to say I'm done. Today's the day to say I'm sick of giving on myself. I want you, God. So if that's you, if you need Jesus today, put your hand in the air. And I'm just going to pray for you. Understand there's no prayer that can save you, but there's a Savior that can save you. If you need Jesus, put your hand in the air. Now the second part of this. If you have a storm that you're going through and you just can't handle it alone, you're sitting in that valley and you're like, God, when will you take me to the mountaintop? You're sitting there and you're looking at the situation and you say, how can I be used in this situation? Then raise your hand for me because I want to pray for you. I want you to reach out to our Jesus, just like Peter did when he began to sink when Jesus called him out to walk upon the water. Raise your hand with me. Let me pray for you. Let me pray that God will enter in and give you the love and peace that only he can give. The healer, the creator, the one and all. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are and thank you for your strength. Thank you for these people, dear God. Show them your power and show them your love. Show them that you're still in control of the valley and you're still in control of the mountaintop. Show them that you're still in control of death and you're still in control of nature, that you're still moving and that you're using us as your vessels. Dear God, I think about how they're going to pack food on Saturday and how that is being you to those people how they're affecting lives through a simple task. Dear God, that's what it's all about, affecting lives through a simple task. Dear God, your task was more than we can handle. Your task was more than we can imagine. But dear God, we thank you for it. We pray that your blood affects Amelia, that your blood affects Spartanburg, that your vessels are filled with you, and that they're making an impact because they're acting. Dear God, thank you that you are God. Thank you that you are Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to say one more thing, and then Brandon's going to lead us in a song of invitation. If you want to know about, more my, about my ministry more, I'll be sitting right over here. If you're like, I love this, I want to see God move in this, and you're like, God's convicted me to give you some money to help you do that. We accept monthly contributors, but more than anything, what we need is prayer. So please pray for me. Come pick up a business card. That will remind you to pray for me. We thank you guys so much for having us here. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Bridgeway. Be the body of Christ to a lost and dying world. Be the body of Christ to people who need a Lord. Be the lost and dying world. Be the vessel to it. Let God illuminate this world because he is the light. Let God illuminate this world through your actions, through who you are, not by because you're good enough, but because Christ is good enough. Would you sing just a verse on course with me?